So our second keynote speaker is Nick Siro. Nick is the chair and chief executive of the AKU Society. And many of you will have heard of this. He's involved in the Innovation Forum, which we heard John talk about earlier. He's a founder of that, really important, uh, sorry, of, of the Cambridge Red Disease Network, isn't it? Cambridge Red Disease Network, he's a, a founder of. Really important um, piece of work that's going on there. And he's going to talk to us uh, from a professional and from a personal perspective about the importance of the AKU Society. So thank you, Nick. Thank you. So it all started for me 15 years ago with the birth of my first son, Julian. And when we brought Julian back from the clinic, we noticed on a Sunday evening that his nappies were going red-black. And we were very alarmed. It was, um, you know, it was, we thought it was blood. We called an emergency doctor who came along, who tested for blood and didn't find any. And he asked us what we'd eaten that day, and it so happened that we'd had some red cabbage. And he said, well, that's what it is. It is the red cabbage going into the breast milk, then into the child and into the urine. And we were not very impressed. So um, next day we went to see our GP, and it took about six months, but eventually it came back with a diagnosis of an ultra-rare disease called alcaptonuria, or AKU, also known as black bone disease. And the first thing the doctor told us what is, was, whatever you do, don't go and Google it on the internet. Now, of course, that's exactly what we did. And we were very alarmed by what we saw. We saw that it was a disease that would lead to steady and severe degeneration, that there was absolutely no cure, that it was ultra rare, and there was very little we could do about it. So this made me think. And um, I spent about a year or so, you know, really just wondering what to do and eventually teamed up with a patient and a doctor based in Liverpool who were just setting up a patient group called the AKU Society. And what I'm going to speak to you about over the next 20 minutes is the journey that we've done over the past 13, 14 years, the trials, the tribulations, the challenges, but also the successes and how we've managed to overcome that, and how 13, 14 years ago, I remember speaking to a fundraiser, asking the fundraiser for help, and the fundraiser saying, look, you know, you really have very little chance of achieving anything, or speaking to our consultant in metabolic medicine, who was saying, look, there's nothing you can do, you should just go home and just enjoy their childhood, to the point where we're now on the verge of a treatment, where we're in phase three trials, and we're hoping to have marketing authorization in the coming years. So to start off with, I'm going to take you through the different steps that we went through in order to achieve this. And to explain how we went through the kind of basic science, the translational science, the clinical science, but also how collaboration was absolutely at the heart of what we did. And when I say collaboration, I mean it very widely. So that's collaboration with academia, with clinicians, with biotechs, with industry, with the whole range to try and achieve what we managed to do. So to start off with, this is what we call the AKU Tetrad. And this was developed um, about 10 or 11 years ago. We had a patient who died and who had donated her body to science. And the professor, one of the co-founders of the AKU Society, a man called Professor Ranganath, who's a personal hero of mine, who's a walking encyclopedia of medical knowledge, but also an absolute passionate advocate for alcaptonuria, so I went to see him and I said, well, what should we do? And he said, well, the first thing we need to do is obviously a post-mortem, an autopsy of the patient to get a better understanding of how AKU is affecting them. Now, you have to remember that AKU, black bone disease, alcaptonuria, was the first disease ever to be shown to have genetic inheritance. And this was in 1902 by a researcher um, in London called Sir Archibald Garrod. And Garrod was very much a pioneer. He was at least 50 years ahead of his time. And he showed that alcaptonuria had Mendelian properties of inheritance. And so it's very much a kind of um, a hero in the medical history books. And alcaptonuria is in all the medical history books because of this. But 100 years later, we still knew very little about the disease. So we did the autopsy of the patient. And we came up with this AKU diagnostic tetrad to understand the disease. On the top left, you have the black urine, as you can see, really dark and pigmented. 
Then you have the blackness in the ears, the ear cartilage, which is very similar to the cartilage in the knees and which hence acts as a very good biomarker of the disease. You have the black spots in the eyes and there you can see that's an elbow joint and it's not even end stage of the disease and it's completely black and pigmented. So pretty nasty. This is our AKU mouse model. Now, no marks for the person who manages to figure out which one has got alcaptonuria. It's obviously the one with, uh, um, with the, the black litter. And so what happened when we'd done the um, diagnostic tetrad is I went back to see Professor Ranganath and I say, well, what do we do next? And he said, well, there's two things we need to do. One is we need to develop a cell model of the disease. And secondly, we need to develop an animal model. Now, I am not a physician, I'm not a scientist, my background is actually in NGOs, I used to run an NGO called Solar Aid, doing solar power in Africa, and my PhD is in social psychology, so this was all very new to me. And so when I asked, well, a cell model, you know, what's that? And he said, well, that's a way of actually understanding the disease and understanding, you know, how the, the evolution of the disease happens. So we raised some funds, we raised £30,000 from the Foyle Foundation, and we funded a PhD program that went exceptionally well. And then at the end of that, it was like, right, now we need an animal model. And for that, we went to see the Big Lottery Fund. And the Big Lottery Fund is a big supporter of rare diseases of neglected causes in the UK. And we got half a million pounds to develop this animal model, which was very difficult at first. I had no idea how difficult translational medicine could be. But for the first two years, we really struggled to get a working model of the disease. But then, with a, using a, a technique called small stay, we managed to show that the pigment, the alcaptonuria, the ochronosis, the blackness that happened happens in humans also happens in these mice. And the drug that we're developing, a drug called nitisinone, in these mice, when given at birth, completely stop, you know, they don't develop any symptoms of the disease, and when given halfway through life, completely halts progression of the disease. So really, a very good working animal model. So this is the metabolic pathway. It's the tyrosine pathway. So tyrosine is broken down from protein. And at each different level, you get a different disease. So there's the iconic phenylketonuria, which you'll all have heard of, PKU, which is treated through a very low protein diet and treated very successfully through this. Um, albinism. Down at the bottom, tyrosinemia type 1, which is a very important disease for alcaptonuria, because this is the disease for which the drug nitisinone was originally developed. Then you have alcaptonuria, which is there, which is due to a deficiency in the enzyme homogentisate 1,2 dioxygenase. And here you have the drug nitisinone, which is very much a wonder drug. It was actually originally a weed killer. It was developed around 30 years ago um, by some researchers who I think were working for ICI or one of the precursors of ICI. And um, the researcher who developed it was working in his garden, and he noticed that around the bottle, the Australian bottle brush plant in his garden, there were no weeds, and he was very intrigued. So he managed to synthesize the compound that was killing these weeds, and synthesized it as this drug nitisinone. Now, it works in plants in the same pathway, the tyrosine pathway, which is very important for photosynthesis. And through um, lateral thinking, him and a team of researchers thought, well, if it works in the tyrosine pathway in plants, it should also work in that pathway in humans. And hence, it should work to cure this particular disease, tyrosinemia type 1. And we were speaking to a nurse the other day who was involved in the early clinical trials in the early 90s. And they were literally mixing the weed killer and giving this to the patients with tyrosinemia, who otherwise would die from liver cancer by age 3. And 25 years later, they're adults, they're in full health, and they're thriving. So very much a wonder drug. And it shows, again, how through lateral thinking, serendipity, and hard work, you really can achieve some pretty amazing things. So it's now used for tyrosinemia. And so some doctors at the National Institutes of Health in the States, under a doctor called Bill Gahl, who's very much an icon in the rare disease field, um, thought, well, if it works for tyrosinemia, it should work for alcaptonuria, because nitisinone, as an enzyme inhibitor, the 4-HPPD enzyme just there should stop the accumulation of this acid, homogentisic acid. And that acid is what causes all the damage in alcaptonuria because that acid binds to cartilage and bone, goes black in a process called ochronosis, and hence the name black bone disease or black urine disease because it oxidizes. Um, the difficulty we have is that whilst tyrosinemia is a disease that will kill children by age three, so you do your clinical trial, either the children live or they don't, alcaptonuria takes decades to develop. 
So this means that my children, for instance, who are aged 11 and 14 now, who both have our captainuria, are in good health. They just have the black urine and blackness in the ears. They don't have any other symptoms. But the real physical symptoms, the spinal collapse, the problems with the heart valves, all the joint deterioration, the problems with the eyes, the problems with the kidneys, etc., will start happening from their 20s, 30s, 40s. And will take decades to evolve and to get worse and worse and worse. And it's very hard to find the funding and to find the partners to do a long-term clinical trial in that way. So, this drug, nitisinone, the NIH did a phase two trial that was very successful. They then did a phase three trial, and unfortunately, that trial failed. So whilst the drug, as you can see there in the urine, works a treat. At the left, you have a baseline at day 7, 16, 30, 60, 90, and then at end point, all the way, it completely clears the urine. Now, this poses one massive problem. How do you do a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial? Because the patients will immediately know if they're on the drug or not. If they're on placebo, then all they need to do is they need to go pass urine and see if it goes black. So there's a real problem there, which we've had to grapple with. But the reason that the trial at the NIH failed was that it was only on 40 patients, it only lasted three years, and they used a single endpoint that was hip rotation. And as you can imagine, in an ultra-rare disease, affects one in half a million people, affects people very differently. Some people it's the elbows, some people it's you know, the, the hips, some people it's the knees. Very, very differently, it's very difficult to get a single evaluation point. And that again raises the problem with ultra-rare diseases of what you do and how do you actually develop good endpoints that can be used in clinical trials. So what we did when that trial failed is we thought, well, we need to give this another chance because everyone was losing interest and everyone was saying, well, it doesn't work. And yet we had a good cell model, we had a good animal model, and we'd just done a very good natural history study from which we'd managed to develop a composite endpoint. So this was just at the end of the NIH trial, when they were finishing their trial in the States. We developed in Europe a composite endpoint that allowed us to score all the different parts of the body, up to a score of around 250, and which then allows us to track the evolution of the disease over time by scoring the joints, the eyes, the ears, and all the different parts. So step number two was setting up a center of excellence and the clinical trials. And the reason we did this is we realized that we, were not, that we did not want to lose the momentum that we'd managed to generate um, in Europe, and we didn't want people to lose heart because of what had been happening in the States. So we joined forces with the NIH, and we got together, and we looked closely with them at what had gone wrong in their trial and what could actually work better in a new trial. And so the first thing we did was set up this Centre of Excellence um, at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. And here you have the launch of our Centre of Excellence. In the middle, you have the co-founder of the AKU Society, Robert Gregory, who unfortunately passed away a few months ago, very, very heavily affected by our captain area, but also uh, he has Parkinson's disease, and we don't know if there's a link because we have many patients with Parkinson's. And then at the left, you have Professor Ranganath, who is the driving force behind this. And when other rare disease patient groups come to see me and say, how did you manage to do this? I always tell them, you have to find your Professor Ranganath, the guy who is going to really work hard day and night, who for a long time was working on this unpaid weekends, evenings, traveling around the world. Um, often we were together going to conferences, trying to lobby industry, trying to work with the regulators to try and develop trials. And then we have also the scientists, the left, the two key scientists, then the head of the Royal Liverpool and our patron. So that was the centre of excellence. And it's very important to have a centre of excellence because the centre of excellence allows us to have a multidisciplinary team where all the patients can be seen and assessed in a single place rather than dispersed throughout the community and throughout the medical system. And so once we had the centre of excellence, we thought, OK, now we need to do a randomised control trial to really manage to prove that this works. And so Professor Ranganath went to see the statisticians in Liverpool and said, I want you to come up with the most difficult clinical trial protocol that you can think of so that we can really show beyond any doubt that this works. And they came up with this three-staged plan. First of all, a phase two study, and the reason we did a new phase two study is that in the previous phase two study, the drug had not received, um, got to steady um, um, steady state. So a phase two study, which we did two years ago, very successfully, allowed us to identify a dose of the drug. We, did, we looked at um, five different doses, zero milligrams, one, two, four, and eight. 
And then that then gave us a dose for a four-year phase three trial on 138 patients in three different countries using a whole range of endpoints as well as the homogenesic acid as a metabolic, as a kind of biomarker, as a surrogate endpoint. And then the third study, SOFIA, which is a cross-sectional study which will allow us to know at what age we need to start treating the disease. And this is the consortium. Okay? So it brings together a range of partners. Um, at the top, you have the Royal Liverpool University Hospital as the key sponsor and the coordinator. You have um, the National Institute of Rheumatic Disease in Slovakia, where there's many patients, uh, much more patients than anywhere else due to consanguinity. The Hôpital Necker Enfant Malade in France, the other clinical trial centre. We have uh, PSR and QDOS, who are CROs, who specialise in orphan drugs, without which we wouldn't be able to do this. Absolutely fantastic organisations. Uh, we have SOBI, Swedish Orphan Biovitrum, who are the key industrial partner, who've helped us with all the regulation, the pharmacovigilance and everything, absolute key partners. Uh, University of Siena, Nordic Bioscience is the, um, doing the biomarker analysis, and then the two patient groups, the AKU Society in the UK and ALCAP in Europe, uh, in France. And this was the launch of the consortium. So we achieved our target. We um, managed to recruit 138 patients in nine months. And the reason we managed to achieve that was because we'd spent the previous three years setting up a global network of AKU societies all around Europe, around the Middle East, in the States, in Asia, which became hubs for the recruitment of patients that when we actually started the trial, we knew we'd managed to achieve the target. And this is what the patients had to say. These trials have given us great hope. This treatment could completely change our lives with that one step closer to a cure. So step number three was working with patients around the world. And um, the reason we did this was obviously we're a patient group, we have to work with patients, but also everyone told us that one of the biggest challenges for the clinical trials would be the recruitment of patients. And so we thought, well, if that's the one place that we can really help, we don't want to let down the consortium in this area. And this is currently where we have the most, pa you know, where our patients are spread out. And you'll see there's these hot spots, like I mentioned, in Slovakia, but also in Jordan, in Qatar, in India. And these are all places where there's often um, a high um, density of patients due to consanguinity. So, for instance, um, in Jordan, actually, this is a place where uh, one of our um, doctors in, who's in Qatar, who's in Jordan, um, studied, um, did his PhD in Liverpool right next to the lab where we were doing AKU and found out about AKU, went back to Jordan, uh, went for dinner with his sister and her husband, noticed that the husband had black spots in his eyes, got him diagnosed um, with al a few urine tests, went back to his home village and identified dozens and dozens and dozens of his cousins with the disease, which he'd never heard of, and up until then, they had no idea what was wrong with their condition. So really quite a fascinating story. And these are all the AKU societies that we've set up in the EU, in Asia, in the Middle East, and North America to try and create this global movement. So we also launched um, an international campaign. And the reason for this is the funding that we managed to get was from the European Commission. We managed to get 6 million euros from the European Commission's FP7 programme, which was really, really tough. Um, but we managed to get it uh, for overall a programme that's costing us 11 million euros. So the phase two study, the phase three study, and the cross-sexual study all together are costing us 11 million euros. And what was missing was actually money to pay for the carers to accompany the patients to the clinical trial centres. And this is something that we haven't managed to put into the budgets because the European Commission would not actually pay for that. So then we did a campaign called Help Us Cure Black Bone Disease and we did a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and we asked our patients around the world to kind of have posters saying help us cure black bone disease to help us raise some funds and also identify more patients to help us with this um, with, with, with the clinical trials. And it led to identification of patients, not just funds. So, for instance, here you have in red uh, Brenda, who is an AKU patient, and she thought she was the only patient in the UK with the disease. And then on a Friday night, she came home, and her husband was reading the Daily Mirror, and he said, look, look, they are talking about your illness here, and there is a centre in Liverpool. And so she contacted the journalist who contacted us, and then within a few weeks, she was actually on the drug and on the, um, at the um, centre of excellence. So step number four is developing new therapies, because obviously nitisinone is a fantastic drug. It's got a very low side effect um, profile. Um, we think it's incredibly promising, but it's not a cure. 
And so we've just applied for Horizon 2020 funding. We managed to get through to the second stage of Horizon 2020. I'm sure many of you here will have gone through Horizon 2020. You'll know how difficult it is. And you'll probably know that for the rare disease call, there were 420 people went for the first stage, 121 are through second stage, and only 12 will actually be successful. So it's showing the need that there is for funding, but also the competition. So through this scheme, uh, we're applying to develop a gene therapy, a CRISPR-Cas therapy, an RNA therapy, drug repurposing therapies, an enzyme therapy, and also a cell encapsulation therapy. And these are all at preclinical stage, at the mouse model stage, which hopefully, by the end of the program, if it's funded, will get us to orphan designation and then into clinical trials. And then the final step was sharing with other patient groups, because everything that we did we learnt by really going to speak to other patient groups and are going to speak to people with the expertise. First amongst those is Eurodis, the European Organisation of Rare Diseases, who were absolutely crucial in helping us. They have a summer school for patient groups and for patient advocates where they train all about the regulatory process, about translational science, all, all the things that you need to put a package together to really develop the drug. And they helped us a lot also with our interactions with industry. You know, they helped us understand how industry thinks, how academia thinks and all that, to bring them all together and to try and make them work together. But then also we were contacted throughout by people who were, wanted to set up their own patient groups and who also wanted to do this kind of drug development and this repurposing of drugs. And that's why with a friend I set up a charity called Find a Cure. And Find a Cure is one of the founders of the Cambridge Rare Disease Network, which you heard about just earlier on. And what we do there is three things. The first one is we help train patient groups. We provide them with training, peer mentoring, and advice on how they can actually identify patients, work with industry, raise funds, and do clinical development. The second thing is we show the link between the rare and the common. And the fact that many rare diseases are what we call fundamental diseases, that they are fundamental to understanding human biology. And that alcaptonuria, for instance, is a great model for osteoarthritis, which is a very common disease. And the third thing we do is drug repurposing, where we take generic drugs and we show how they can be used for rare diseases through clinical development programs. And actually, if any of you are interested, we have a networking event on drug repurposing for rare diseases on Thursday, 20th of August, from 7 to 9 p.m. at Bar Rouge in Cambridge. And if you're interested, do come and see me at the end about that. And then finally, if you're interested also, um, I put together a book with chapters from leading authors all about social entrepreneurship and rare diseases. And this looks at all the different stages that you have to go through, you know, as a business or a social enterprise or a patient group, if you really want to get involved in the rare disease movement. Thank you.